We create a video for local purposes of helmet and shoulder pad removal on an injured football player of two scenarios. An injured football player with an isolated leg injury and an injured football player with a possible spine injury. In the context of uh, selective spinal mobilization where EMS may not transport a patient on a backboard, but perhaps in a C collar. So with that change of protocol in the EMS world and injured football players into being football season, it was time to do something to educate our folks in area EMS. All right, Coach, uh, you're know, welcome here today. We are filming sports injuries, obviously. What are some of the injuries that you see on the field? Well, you know, the main uh, the main ones we see definitely are, are the ankles and the knees, um, some shoulders and things like that. But most of the time when it's upper body, uh, they, they can get to the sidelines themselves and, and then we can look at it. So, so mainly, um, you know, when, when I'm getting called out on the field, it's usually something lower body uh, or uh, wind knocked out of them or, or maybe if it's a... Uh, um, severe concussion or something where what are what are some of the more severe types of injuries you've seen um, I, the worst one I think I've seen is a ankle that was broken and dislocated um, and and uh, um, you know it was it was off on a different direction and that, you know. uh, some of the some of the dangers of leaving the equipment on is access to airway with a uh, helmet and a mask on, you're not going to be able to control that airway the way it should be or go, move on to advanced or even basic techniques. And then with the pads, you have no access to the chest uh, for things like CPR being the most important or needle decompressions. Um, also, I would think that you know a slick plastic on a slick plastic is going to tend to want to move more than it would be a, you know, a shirt or bare skin. Helmet, there's multiple ways to uh, un to take off the face mask. Um, with the screws right here, you're going to want to use a screwdriver, um, a manual screwdriver, or we have all the trainers um, from Freeman have clippers. We have angel trainers like that, and we have some like gardening pruners um, that are good for getting in between and cutting that off. Um, then you also have the tin straps here, which on all the helmets to take that off, we would just cut with scissors. On both spots so that just falls off and then some helmets um, like this Rydell one they have this uh, speed mechanism so the little circle on the inside to remove this all you have to do you can take um, a pin or if you have a fancy tool to go with it the pin you just hit right in the center Put on the side. it pops up just like that got that one good and then to put it back on which we don't need to worry about with us right. but that's what this side of the tool is for gotcha. okay. Get it just... uh, right now, yeah okay thank you you're gonna try this so yeah it'll automatically release it Attention to the game, and you see a player that doesn't get up after a play, you know, after a hit. Uh, that's certainly a time to be paying attention. It doesn't necessarily mean jump out of the truck and run. You've got coaching staff and training staff that know those players and know how they react, and may even should actually know quite a bit about their history. And if they have something already underlying going on, that they may not pop up right away. But uh, just to be watching for that hand signal again, I should be this circular hand motion helicopter type thing. To, to signal for that. It can be a challenge if that player is escorted off the field by coaching and training staff and then further evaluated on, say, on the sideline because you may kind of lose them in the heads and the bodies over there to see what's going on. But um, One step that we tried to implement a year ago actually was better communication with the training staff and exchange phone numbers of the crew members or the, uh, the truck phone, phone numbers with that staffer, that training staff trainer out of sight and weren't able to make that hand signal thing they could simply call. Uh, some places have tried radio communications with little two-way family talk type radios to holler back and forth across the field for things. But 
that's an area that is always going to fumble some because communication literally is a problem on a lot of things and it's going to happen here too. It's going to be a lack of communication that will lead to just the slow down of response. I don't know that it would ever actually have a, a jeopardizing effect, but it would slow down of response. Just not realizing that a staff EMS crew needed to be on the field or go to the sideline for a player. Can you tell me what's going through your mind as an athletic trainer when you see an injury that occurs on the field, maybe a hard hit, spearing, butt blocking, or maybe a defenseless player gets hit and just knocked down, possible spinal or back injury. What are you thinking when that player doesn't get up? Um, first thing is just to get out to them as soon as possible. Um, I always assume worst case scenario, so talk to them. If they're not responding, then immediately get things started in the emergency action plan. Um, if they are responding, kind of see if they have any numbness, any tingling, where their pain is, and try and um, go down a list of if it's severe enough that we need to go ahead and spine board to if we need to stabilize with a splint to that they can just take a couple minutes and walk off the field. So kind of have a checklist to go down um, to determine how serious the injury is. Per second scenario, we mm -hmm. remove the helmet and pads. Can you verbally take us through that process real quick? Okay. So the head trainer will usually do C-spine stabilization once they um, get to the point where they feel like that's necessary. Um, and then, for, so their entire job is to stabilize that for the whole thing because that's our primary concern. Um, then we're going to remove, cut off the jersey, cut off the shoulder pads. Um, then we're going to do a six-person lift. Um, the person on top that you saw, James, he came in the, from the front to stabilize the neck because in order to take off the helmet and shoulder pads, the person holding C-spine at the head would have to remove their hands in order to take all that stuff off. So James came in to stabilize from the front while they were lifting him up and then setting him back down, then we can reinitiate C-spine. Can you tell us some of the dangerous techniques and some dangerous plays that can occur maybe from blocking and tackling and maybe late hits, uh, some of those dangers. Well, you know, and that's one thing we always talk to our players is, you know, you want to play aggressive, you want to, you know, um, play physical, but you want to play the right way, you know. Um, so we are, are very uh, up to date on all the uh, um, heads up training and things of that nature. Um, and we also, whenever we teach how to block, uh, we always teach with that lead with the hands. Uh, it's important, you know, as a coaching staff, uh, we, we, we take it upon ourselves uh, to be up to date on all the training, um, uh, whether it be the, the new things off of uh, uh, NFHS or USA Football or MISHA um, to make sure that, uh, again, we, we care about the, the, the players as people first before football players. And so uh, you know, we want to play this great game, but, but we want to we wanna make sure everyone's safe doing it. So that day we were shooting the video on the football field was a hot day and we kind of ran out of time so in order to finish some of this we decided to move inside so in, in doing so we had to change out some of our actors a little bit so we're going to complete this uh, indoors uh, and kind of pick up where we left off a little bit. Uh, you can see obviously we have a different player down on the ground but uh, demonstrating here simple a little bit a little bit different technique than earlier shown on the removal of the helmet and the shoulder pads there was a little bit less movement here actually of this particular person in this scenario see there you got to have several hands to get in there and move the uh, pads and the helmet all out of the way hopefully in one one effort there so that the patient can be uh, rested back down on the surface uh, ground floor whatever it happens to be and then uh, you know just an ordinary C collar application is performed and in this particular one we're going to as soon as he gets that collar attached there, we're going to show a, a six-person lift. You know, and you can tell <clears throat> that, you know, we're doing this a certain way for demonstration just to kind of show you things maybe you've never seen. You probably find better different ways of doing this as long as the same thing is accomplished because this is all in, uh, in thinking and keeping in mind that this is being done because we're not using a backboard. So this is kind of the reason for some of this is to... Uh, 
you know, the right players have to be in place. Uh, I've said this a few times, and I want to reiterate that the athletic trainer staff are uh, really good at knowing the equipment. Helmet removal, uh, so C-spine is taken from the front. A, a provider actually removes the helmet, uh, same way it's done in uh, very many other training classes, uh, PHTLS, uh, different different techniques. A football helmet's a little bit different than the, than say a motorcycle helmet, but then again, once once one one more time, we have uh, C collar administration. Um, This one is going to use the uh, employ the use of a scoop stretcher, and so you know again you, knowing what tools you have and keeping it an understanding that uh, transporting a person on a on a backboard is something we're trying to get away from when it's a, a, applicable. Um, there, there's I, I, again I can say that there's you know different ways of doing this. Uh, it's all a matter of knowing your manpower, who you have, what, what their knowledge and limitations are, how many people you actually have there. You're going to have, you see some athletic trainers in the video here, obviously an EMS crew. You're going to have coaches, uh, different people you can ask to do certain uh, things for you. Standard uh, scoop stretcher, uh, all attached, and this is a fairly small number of people, uh, partly for uh, being able to. There's multiple ways of actually accomplishing that, getting that person off the ground and onto a cot. So the protocol that we're uh, focusing on for this one to uh, highlight a few parts at least are the spinal immobilization protocol. It, uh, the highlighted parts here that we're showing are that the patient must be fully alert and oriented, not under the influence of alcohol or drugs, no distracting injuries, no pain with uh, midline spinal palpation, no pain with gentle side-to-side -side rotation. You need to assess these patients, especially the last two parts there. These things you have to actually do. You have to actually touch their spine and palpate for any kind of pain. You also need to ask them to move their head side to side. It's the only real way for you to be able to assess and document those things. I want to give thanks for this video. It wouldn't be possible if not for the participation and assistance from uh, high school f coaching staff from the Joplin High School, Freeman Sports Medicine, Mets Ambulance, Joplin Fire Department, and Mike for taking some aerial uh, shots for us.